días a todos y a todas. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here today at this presentation. And in the world, uh, sorry, in this presentation of the World Disaster Report 2022 of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and chaired by the President of the Spanish Red Cross, Maria del Mar Pajeo. And we will also have the Princess of the Health Minister. And I would like to thank you uh, for being here in our house and in this uh, event that we are holding with the International uh, Federation. The presentation of the World Disaster Report is part of the priorities and events that the Spanish Red Cross is organizing within the framework of the Spanish Presidency of the Council of the European Union, which, as the Spanish Red Cross, we think we are in a key moment in order to analyze uh, our needs. We need to build a fairer social Europe that promotes rights and values and respond to global challenges and promoting multilateralism and fair EU external relationships that put people at the center. The World Disaster Report 2022 takes on special relevance within framework of these two priorities, as it focuses on the devastating global impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the comprehensive people-centered response we provide as national societies around the world, and on the lessons learned that we will necessarily help us to anticipate and respond to future challenges and disasters at both the Spanish and international levels. You are invited to this event, all those institutions and organizations that have played a key role in the response of the Spanish Red Cross. Your participation in this event is therefore very important in recognizing and thanking the Spanish Red Cross for its support. The joint effort we made in response to the severe health, social, and economic crisis caused by the pandemics, and how we can generate joint learning, learning to anticipate future crises. We will listen to four voices, to four panelists, who will remind us why it is important to continue talking three years later about the impact of the pandemic in terms of mental health in the social labor and socioeconomic sphere, and what have been the key factors of the response of the International Federation and the Spanish Red Cross both in the international and state or national level, as well as the lessons learned that we have generated. Once interventions are over, we would like to encourage a constructive debate with all the people present and according to the different and valuable role you have played in the response to the crisis. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Maria del Mar Pajeo, president of the Spanish Red Cross and host of this event, who would like to share with all of you a few words of welcome and reflection on the pandemic and response we provide to the International Federation and the Spanish Red Cross. Thank you very much. Minister, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the public administration, diplomatic world, civil society, the private companies, and international agencies. Distinguished president of the Standing Commission of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, colleagues of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, colleagues, it is an honor for the Spanish Red Cross and for me to to welcome you most cordially to this launching event, the first in Spain of the World Disaster Report 2022 of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. This year, the report is titled Trust, Equity, and Local Action, and is based on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic so that we can be better prepared for health emergencies or disasters that may occur in the future. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an unprecedented disaster that, to date, has resulted in the death of nearly 7 million people, according to the World Health Organization. 
and devastating and unprecedented human consequences around the world. No disaster has been as good as this, but the pandemic has not affected everyone equally. The pandemic has exacerbated inequality, and it has affected to the most vulnerable people. The impact on people welfare has been big, and it has a direct impact in their mental health and emotional health. The consequences of the pandemic in the social, occupational, and social economic spheres have also been devastating, and serious inequalities have been accentuated and widened affecting women, young people, the small self-employees, migrants, or single-parent families headed by women. National Red Cross and Red Crescent societies had to face new challenges in order to adapt to a changing context. We acted with agility, transparency, collaboration, and cooperation among peers, sharing experiences and knowledge. We had to redouble our efforts because we know that no one is safe until everyone is safe. At the Spanish Red Cross, as we said, efforts were redoubled. We launched the Plan Responde at the national level, which represented the largest mobilization of resources, capabilities, and people in our history. Through this operation, we reached 5 million people, 860,000 people, sorry. We offer, we provided more than 41 million responses <coughs> and delivered more than 61,000 emergency reliefs as aging products, clothing, financial aid, and housing assistance. At the international level, we supported other national societies in the response to the pandemic in, seven, in 27 countries in the world and we ensure continuity of service, adapting our actions and mobilizing additional resources. It was an unprecedented situation to which we were able to respond because we joined forces as an international federation and because we were able to count on the support of four national societies, key uh, uh, factors trust, equity, and local action. We had the trust of people we served because we had built a bond with them that made them willing to receive us, to open us their homes and accept the uh, actions that we uh, suggested them. We offer an equitable and comprehensive response to all people, thereby tackling the inequities that affect the most vulnerable groups in these circumstances. And thanks to that local action, through our volunteers, we could create a great operation. 50,000 new uh, volunteers join us throughout the country, joining the organization, existing volunteers with all kinds of profiles and willing to help and collaborate in such complex situation. In this sense, one of the greatest lessons we wanted to share with you today is that everywhere and every moment we can do great things, simple things, but very valuable things in order to help people. The response we offer was coordinated from us, central management, and was common to all areas and territories of the organization. We mobilize all our resources, adapting what we know how to do to the needs with a much more comprehensive, broad, and transversal vision that allowed us to be closer to people and communities. A flexible model of care, permanent communication between territories with the public administration and with key partners of the Spanish Red Cross, integration and cooperation between different areas in the organization, and digitalization 
have been other key elements of success. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a unique opportunity to consolidate the lessons we have learned after the COVID-19 pandemics and put them together to prepare and anticipate new and future health emergencies or disasters, putting people at the center and preventing the same mistakes from being made. The report that we present today highlights that we must prepare now. Today's world demands a joint effort so communities are ready and to decrease suffering. Each and every one of us, government, civil society, the international community, private enterprises, and the International Federation's network of members must ensure that a new global approach is applied to implement preparedness measures. I'm sure that this meeting will be the ideal opportunity to discuss all these issues of concern to us. Without further ado, I would like to thank you for your participation. And well, let's share this space. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Presidenta, por las inspiradoras palabras. Very much uh, for those inspiring words. Um, I'm going to read. Lázaro Galeano, many small, Eduardo Galeano, many small people in small places doing small things can change the world. International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, the world's largest support network with its 191 national societies and 15 million volunteers, is here with us today through the Deputy Director of the Regional Office for Europe, based in Budapest, Hungary, who would also like to share a word of welcome. Maria Alcazar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. Ministry, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the public administration, of the civil society and diplomatic organizations, President of the Spanish Red Cross and former or current colleagues of the Spanish Red Cross. It's an honor for the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescents to be at this uh, presentation of the World Report of Disasters focused on the COVID-19 pandemic. 30, from, since 30 years ago, the International Federation presents every year a disasters report that not only gathers information of the uh, societies, but also of independent associations analyzing trends, challenges of the humanitarian crisis with the goal uh, in order to learn and to be ready for the future. These reports at the beginning were focused on gathering da qualitative data related with natural disasters. But with time, they opened their uh, approach, including crises that affect people's life and analyzing all the aspects. Maybe the changing moment was in 2018, where we published a report focused in HIV crisis and its impacts in health, economy, and co-living with other people. 15 years later, this approach is present in this report, which analyzes the impact of the COVID-19, which has been the uh, uh, most important crisis in the past years. Its effects 
and uh, measures that were adopted affected everyone in the world, affecting employment, uh, food safety, vulnerabilities, violence, loss of opportunities of education, loss of employment for youth, and also affecting to public services, not only in health, in every aspect. As uh, president of the Spanish Red Cross, not everyone suffers equally. As always, in every crisis, the, the COVID-19 pandemic affected to the most vulnerable groups, and in fact, in some cases, exacerbated vulnerabilities that were already there. This 2022 report says that no the international nor the international societies nor the countries were ready for this. In 2019, the International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent approved the resolution number three to act together in order to fight against epidemics and to be ready. A need that we could see only three months later. According to the health organization, um, health organization in the WHO, this affected, the COVID-19 affected in every aspect, to nature, to climate change, and it's still, that resolution is still relevant today. And now we have an opportunity, a unique opportunity in the World Health uh, uh, Summit in order to take note of the lessons learned and to analyze how uh, being ready, it's a, a good way to fight against uh, pandemics and other sorts of crises. We need to give response to the different uh, effects that these sort of diseases have. And this is maybe one of the main uh, lessons learned of the COVID-19. It wasn't just only a health crisis. It has many repercussions. And we must do this involving society, communities, civil society, enterprises that today are here in this debate and represent a good example of the response that uh, was given in Spain and other societies. Unfortunately, the world had to face the COVID-19 pandemic to understand the consequences of past mistakes and to check with solidarity, well, that solidarity and not competition is the best measure for public health. We have the opportunity and also the duty to learn from these complex and painful experiences to be better prepared. From the International Federation, we'd like to acknowledge and thank the Spanish Red Cross for the amazing response with the Respond Plan, taking into account the health consequences as well as the socio-economic field. And we'd like to thank the generosity of the Spanish Red Cross because despite being one of the countries most affected initially, we were able to support the Red Cross and Red Crescents from other countries, not just with financial support, but also with technical support, sharing tools and experiences from the Spanish response. Also, our gratitude to the Spanish government for their contribution to the calling of the International Federation that supported the response to the pandemic internationally, especially in Europe. Throughout the pandemic, as Maria del Mar has mentioned, we repeated on end that no one is safe until we are all safe. And we should not forget that. And we hope that these kind of dialogues will help us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria, for that general overview of, the, of our history and the reports that we have here after a few years. So after finishing this first block, I have the honor of introducing the Minister of Health, Mr. Jose Manuel Miñonez Conde, and his reflections on the pandemic will be very welcome. Dear Minister, thanks so much. Thank you so much. 
Dear President and dear John, Director of the Regional Office for Europe, dear Commission representatives, rest of the authorities, dear friends and colleagues, good day everyone. Every time I come here, and it's the first time, the third time actually, the same word comes to mind, which is gratitude, for a twofold reason. First of all, for the invitation to be with you today, which is very important, and secondly, gratitude to the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, not just for the report that you'll be presenting today, but also for your daily work. Thanks so much. Without these 160 years of history of the Red Cross, modern and contemporary history in the world will be different, much darker and less decent, in my opinion. And there are seven words that I like, like referring to when I speak about the Red Cross. Humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, volunteering, unity and universality. These are seven words that have an important meaning. And I think these are the seven principles guiding the Red Cross and the Red Crescent actions everywhere where you are present. And these are seven words that give us uh, an important cut-off point that you have set an important threshold to serve humanity in these difficult times. And that's why you deserve my amazement and gratitude that I'd like to express once again today, not just in my name, but in the name of the government and the Ministry of Health. Dear President, Maria del Mar, even though you already know, I'd like to repeat this again. It's never enough. You and the whole team that make up the Spanish Red Cross have my affection, my recognition, and the recognition from the Ministry of Health and our whole team for all these years of commitment and dedication and also of help to those who need it the most at the most needed times. I've said it before and I'll repeat it again. The 024 is our hotline for suicidal behavior and that's possible thanks to you, thanks to Red Cross that's behind those hotlines that are working 24-7 every day of the year. And I think that the 158,000, the number might, might be short, but the nearly 160,000 calls of this hotline and the nearly 5,000 high-risk calls that were referred to the 112, the safety emergency services showed that this initiative is very useful and that we keep learning with this hotline which is much more than a helpline. So I didn't I don't think that Henry Dunang in Solferino could imagine that in, uh, with an office with just 35 phones so much could be done for this cause. However, every person you've taken care of and every person you've cared for and all the suicides you've avoided add up to that long list of lives saved by the Red Cross. Of course, the Ministry of Health, and I speak um, in the name of the whole of the Spanish society, has with all of you um, a debt that is hard to pay back. And we're here to present this World Disaster Report. It is not a very friendly topic with that name, disaster, but it's a very essential exercise of maturity and prevention, and the topic is especially relevant when we speak about the pandemic. And I think it's quite right to hold this report for this reason, looking at the future by correcting the past mistakes. I think that's the way we should do things. That's why, that's why after the COVID-19 pandemic, the most serious pandemic we've had in the last 100 years, the first lesson we need to learn is humility. Spain or Europe or the world could not predict such an aggressive pandemic. And as you've mentioned, it's obvious that we're not, we were not ready for it. The second lesson that we can draw is the need to reinforce, as you've said, the public health teams, not just in epidemiological oversight and the alert systems, but also in the perspective of promoting health and preventive health care. These ambitious targets also necessary, entail two things that I'm firmly believing. First, prevention, which is key, and secondly, promoting healthy habits, which will help us face the future. 
And these are, no doubt, objectives. And when we speak from the Ministry of Health, these are um, targets set in the mid to long term, and that's not usual to look so much in the short and or mid and long term, but it's necessary. And I think our strategic effort links with this priority that should be in our line of work, and we have been doing it that way until then. Hence the promotion to the strategic framework of primary care that we had approved and that we're implementing with a budget to improve our primary care but also to improve the whole hospital environment. And as I was saying, no health system was ready for this stress test. And if we can draw some positives from, from this, which are few, but there are some, it's at least the need of our um, healthcare system and the massive effort of all the health care professionals. And at another event, I mentioned that the success of the health policies need the help of the people who enable those policies. And that's something you really take care of here. And we've mentioned that in other former visits. We need to care for our carers to be better prepared for the next, next test we might have. That will no doubt come at a certain point. It's true that the pandemic in Europe has gone to an oversight stage now. But we still need to be alert because this pandemic is still taking away lives here and in the less privileged parts of the world. And hence, our commitment with the solidarity initiatives, globally such as GABI or the COVID mechanism, are still very present. And in fact, last week at the Council of Ministers, we approved the funding agreement of 170 million euros to keep collaborating with these domination mechanisms for the next decade. The consequences of this pandemic, we'll probably never forget them, preparing our healthcare system with the need of the public health agency that is already rooted when we the promotion of the pandemic treaty that throughout the presidency, the Council of the European Union has mentioned to keep advancing and is now in the final stage. These are just some examples, but there are many other examples that we need to prepare for the future. The target is just to have a robust, a more robust and quality public health system producing health instead of health care. And that prevents the disease and not just cures it. A model with prevention, detection and early intervention capacities before public health emergencies and other challenges. The present poses massive challenges, such as the conflicts we mentioned before, and the wars we currently have in Ukraine and the Middle East, and the future will probably put us to the test, as you mentioned in the report, facing this future with equity, trust, and local action entails that this is the best formula to be successful. And if you allow me, also joint work or teamwork, and that's where we are. We'll keep being there, and we'll, also meet that. we'll always meet there. So thanks so much for all your work, and thank you for your invitation. And of course, since we're going to keep working together and believing together in this route focused on mental health, and I avail of this forum to congratulate you again, because the 024 hotline project for which we brought the European Commissioner Kirokides to get it to know in person is a best European practice within the European presidency that is now extending to the rest of the countries of the European Union. That's so thanks to all of you. Thanks so much and congratulations. Minister, we only have words of gratitude for the affection in the organization and the International Federation and the whole international movement of the Spanish Red Cross. Your words make us reflect on health and on the preparation for future emergencies and an uncertain future that provokes certain very continuous changes. Thanks so much once again for being here. Thank you dearly and see you soon. So next, let's begin with the thematic blocks. At the beginning, I said that we're going to have four panelists, and we're going to begin with a block related to health specifically, especially focused on the impact of the pandemic on mental health in Europe and in Spain. 
On this occasion, we have Maria Alcázar, whom you already know, and I invite her to join us on the stage again. And Fatima Cabello, the director of the Health Knowledge Area of Red Cross of Spain. Thank you both. As I said, the World Report is about uh, learnings, experiences, and challenges in the COVID-19 pandemics. was an overwhelming and global crisis that hit, hit it everyone. It stopped our lives, and then it changed it for a long time. It was a very painful experience, and sometimes we need to, you know, move on in order to, well, <laughs> keep going. And we need this as people, uh, I mean, as person, um, family, institutions, and countries. And this moving on need uh, is understandable, but we can't forget what we learned because we must be ready for future crises. Uh, an element was was highlighted highlighted with the COVID-19 pandemic was the importance of mental health, and that many countries weren't paying attention to it, even in I mean in normal situations, let's say, and that we didn't have enough resources in order to face these sort of situations, the pandemics highlighted the need to include in a more cross-functional uh, way mental health from the very beginning of any crisis. Having mental health, robust mental health systems and also funding systems and also to have uh, people with the right skills. And we must understand that this is not only a uh, health care matter. It's important for enterprises, societies, and for everyone, even for us. The COVID-19 uh, achieved something very important, which is that now we are talking about mental health, both in public spaces and also in personal spaces with the pandemics. We began to talk about the resources that we needed, uh, our needs, uh, things that were important for us that until then were ignored. And many of us, I'm sure that we identify with this. It was the first time that we began to talk, uh, you know, to say, uh, sometimes I'm not well, or that we were worried about uh, relatives, friends, that we didn't know what to do, even taking care of ourselves or take care of other people. And we created a small uh, foundation in order to have a space to talk about these topics. The lockdown and other prevention measures uh, changed our lives. We lived with fear and anxiety with something that was unknown for us. With the uncertainty of, for the future or how long it will uh, take, difficulties to say goodbye and have, well, a correct uh, grief of our uh, relatives, the loss of uh, incomings, which also affects to mental health, and not always we take it into account. And since the beginning, with this report, we could conclude that this one, this was one of the great learnings and that we as society, we have learned very much about this. Regarding fundings, I think that we haven't learned enough. On average, globally, only 2% of the uh, health budget are well invested in mental health. So this is not appropriate for developed countries. And there is no fundings for medicines or specialized therapies or having, for instance, support networks so people can participate there. 
in many countries, insurances even, I mean, it doesn't even include mental health. Reports state that every euro that is invest, uh, stated, invested in, well, in treatments for mental health or anxiety has a five years return in the improvement of health. I mean, if we feel good, if we react at the beginning, will our health will be better and the cost we will uh, lower. But it's also an improvement in productivity because if we don't feel well, we can't contribute to society and to co economy. So mental health is an, in an investment, not a cost. But as we can see, we, we have a lot of work to do in that sense. As we said, crisis don't affect equally to everyone. In the COVID-19 pandemics, children and youth were especially vulnerable. Access to education was interrupted, or at least as the way they already knew. The world wasn't ready to offer or provide online education, and in many countries, this wasn't even an option. And this not only affects to uh, to I mean to formal education, but also for for everything, uh, self-esteem and other topics. Children, and especially young people lived this in a very delicate moment of their lives, and they could see that this affected to their parents, and they had to be all the time in front of a screen. But not every family had uh, this uh, uh, screens. This impacted not only youth, and we hope that this highlights the importance of mental health also in children and uh, youth. One out of five children in the world have uh, suffered of an episode related with mental health. Those sort of problems on average begin before 14 years old. Anxiety, change in uh, behavior are well among the main, main reasons that affect the children. And if we don't react, uh, early, this will affect to the future adults, not only to have a healthy life, but also have uh, well, a long and, and dignified life. With the um, pandemics, we began to talk about suicide. One person dies or suic commits suicide every 40 seconds. And this is very sensitive uh, among people between 15 and 20 years old. And uh, countries don't have enough resources in order to approach this. Many countries now have uh, made this visible. And for instance, in Spain, we have created a collaboration between the Red Cross and the public administration. But this is a problem that is ignored in other countries. 77% of these suicides are committed in countries that, where they don't even talk about this. So we have a long path in front of, ahead of us. And as we said, we have to prevent and get families involved, and also the schools and society and enterprises in order to uh, approach this. But we also had positive lessons. The Red Cross and the Red Crescent, it's pain is a good example of this. We well, had many lessons learned. We began to pay more attention to the mental health in 2019, only 20% of the national societies of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent had activities related with mental health. Now, in 2020, sorry, 70, 63% had those sort of actions. So 
now 136 uh, social nas uh, society, national societies have actions, uh, activities related with mental health, for instance, um, helplines and so for or activities for children. And we have confirmed again that, as we said, crisis doesn't affect everyone equally, and we must provide different uh, and responses to different people. For instance, elderly. And there was another group that was really affected by the pandemics, or people with existing health problems, children, migrants, uh, refugees, that not only in the context of the pandemics, but all, I mean, they are normally vulnerable groups, people who, well, lost their incomings. We were all affected in a different way, and we need a different uh, response. We also had a positive experience. We had to be more creative in order to provide responses in a very new context. And we had great progress in the way that we provided uh, services for mental health. For instance, we opened helplines or different social networks in order to provide services in a safe way, friendly way, and also conf confidential way. We began to use uh, social network in order to raise awareness about the importance of health and also to share tools. The World Report talks about the importance of trust in mental health, and this trust uh, slowly began to grow. With the helplines, this trust uh, grew. Uh, in fact, we saw an increase of uh, men that required the service in a friendly space, in a confidential space. We could see that men that the, I mean, uh, normally stigma on mental health affect more to them. Well, they approached the Red Cross, migrant people and displaced people, not only in the COVID context, suffer very much because they are far away from their relatives and they've been forced to leave their homes uh, without knowing if they will be able to go back. Uh, they need to adapt to a new context. And we can say that the Red Cross and the Red Crescent have integrated mental health in response for migrant people. We saw that in Europe, in many countries, and in, in, when we received people from Ukraine. Ukraine sorry. Uh, recently, I visited Armenia, which is a country that uh, gives shelter for people for Agurnon and Karabet. And from the very first moment, the Red Cross uh, provided psychosocial services for those people. And I wanted to uh, acknowledge and thank the um, commitment of the European Commission because they, sur they supported us in order to provide uh, mental health services and also to people in Ukraine affected, in, I mean, with problems of mental health and in other countries, not only in Spain. And I also wanted to thank um, the Spanish organizations because they made a cute effort in order to reinforce and strengthen the services for mental health. As I said, it's very important to take care of the care, uh, people that take care of us. In our case, we provided help to volunteers and staff we have many examples of this. We developed a, a guideline for volunteers, Bulgarian uh, Red Cross open spaces for young volunteers in order to check, well, how they were doing and what were their resources. And to summarize, I would like to insist in that the key for the future is to have that uh, ability to learn and build from what we developed during the pandemics and doing it in a way that we build trust and doing it in, an, uh, in equity and with local action. Here we have a very good example of this with the Spanish Red Cross. Thank you very much.
Pues, y quedan en silencio. Right. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you for giving us this perspective about the general effect in Europe and also by focusing on mental health. So Maria has given a few figures, and when I read the global report, the global disaster report, and apart from that, after reflections that I've made during the pandemic, when you read the report, where they reflect dating analyses from many countries, and through the experience of national societies with many different circumstances, at the end of the day, the conclusions and the lessons with different life contexts, cultures, and economic situations, the lessons are common to many of us. Therefore, if you read the report, you'll see that the learning is a global learning. And through the Spanish Red Cross, and by mentioning the part that Maria touched on, I think that the COVID pandemic had a health origin, that's clear, due to a disease that is unknown, but that has a physical effect. And then the important bit are all the consequences that it had around it not just on physical health, of course, but also on mental health. And with all the conditioning factors at a social scale, and I like to highlight that because they clearly shed light and come back to mental health. The pandemic was considered to be a non-discriminatory emergency, but it in fact, it did affect poorer people and richer people. But it has been proven that due to these health-determining factors, inequality was detected. And as the President mentioned, there was a return backwards in the SDG achievement. And the effects on mental health in Spain in the way we experienced them and in how we saw them from the institution. And due to the restriction measures to contain the pandemic, at some point there was isolation and everyone was locked in at home. And for a culture such as ours, it's difficult to manage. That's to begin with. And apart from uncertainty, I had the occasion or the chance to see what was being experienced in hospitals. And as the minister mentioned, in hospitals, people were overwhelmed. And health professionals never thought we could be in that situation. And one of the things that really affected the most health professionals, because we were not used to it, was to actually see the loneliness of patients. That was extremely hard. The fact that people could not say farewell to their relatives, but that measure was somehow necessary. So regarding mental health, initially, we had isolation, fear of contagion, also bereaving the passing of relatives and that couldn't be done properly. And then other colleagues will speak about the social factors of health and also the effects on economy, employment, and education, or even the cancellation of, of schooling and the effects all that had. That's why I say that the COVID health crisis has highlighted the weight of health social factors and the circumstances where people are born, develop, live, work, and get old. So the report is focused on the equality, trust, and local and community action. Regarding trust, 
I think this topic is essential because in these situations we need the trust of the population and that the population trusts organizations and administrations and so on. Otherwise, as I was saying, I've had the chance of seeing in other large epidemics such as the Ebola epidemic or the cholera epidemic. If information is not very clear, I mean, these diseases are new and sometimes information is managed as, as we can, but out of the three learnings revealed by the report, trust seems to be essential. Without the trust of the population, we cannot act on the different pillars on which we need to act for controlling that epidemic, avoiding fake news and all the beliefs, the culture, the interpretation, or the understanding. And I could give you examples that are kind of funny to us from other experiences we've had in Africa, according to the culture, with magical conceptions of the disease and so on. However, when I made the analysis of what we experience here, and the personal reflections, things were not so different to what we thought sometimes, or what some people thought when they thought that chips were being inoculated with the vaccines. And equity is another of the important learnings of the pandemic. Even though it was catalogued as something non-discriminatory, it didn't affect everyone equally due to their prior vulnerability or the access to health services and employment in the socioeconomic conditions, as well as the living conditions with isolation and lockdown. And then the local and community action has already been mentioned, but it's essential to go hand in hand with the community and get to know which are the needs and count on them and working jointly and cross-sectionally, not just the administration, but also the administrations and the population, as well as the organizations. But to specify the mental health actions, the thanks to the responder plan that has all been named on several occasions today, and are concentrated on the common response, integrating all the working areas of the institution and checking out the local needs. And that was done in a centralized, coordinated, and cross-sectional manner. But from the healthcare perspective, especially mental health, what we did was to come up with new ways of working. For example, from the Red Cross Health Area, by offering the possibility to workers and to volunteers, we established a hotline to call and be able to speak freely as people intervening in the first line of defense. So I have to say that this phone number, Cruz Roja de Escucha, which means Cruz Roja, Cruz Roja listens to you to approach the needs of the staff and the volunteers, is still working nowadays. And it's had important interventions, such as in the La Palma volcano volcano emergency. And we also spoke about the whole digital world. That was something that kind of was set up of the, at all levels to block that isolation that we saw afterwards as having a big effect on mental health, mainly for young people and children. And Telephone follow-up was done to vulnerable users and the interventions we had in penitentiary institutions were adapted with people deprived of freedom in context of addictions with psychosocial support. So teams could not go into the actual jails, of course, but different notebooks were created that went through a quarantine. So we were kind of reinventing the activity because the essential bit was for the Red Cross not to cut off the help to those vulnerable people so that we could keep helping. 
And another thing I'd like to highlight is everything that has to do with the care for the people who are intervening. We have a track record and that's our work target with different vulnerable groups in difficult situations. But regarding the carers and the people who are on the first line, the volunteers, and the people who are working on different social, social and health actions, there it's essential to give them that support. We can also see it with the teams of the 024 hotline to care for the carer, as we were saying before. If those teams do not have space to express emotions, it will be difficult to carry out their work. And then from the health area and the Red Cross in general, as Maria mentioned, there were several awareness raising campaigns specifically to fight the stigma that we have already mentioned before. Information at the end of the day is power and it gives people peace of mind when we know what's happening. So different campaigns of awareness raising were held on the disease and even managing emotional self-care with different measures and online trainings accessible. And as Maria was saying, in the whole international side, we share that with Latin America because we have the same language and mainly for those people who were still not in the situation we were in. And therefore, as the lessons learned, um, reflecting on the COVID pandemic and other epidemic outbreaks, the, the teaching eventually is that even it may be an out, a health outbreak, it will have effects at different levels that will last in time. In the Ebola crisis, I remember that children didn't go to school for a year and there was research showing an effect of that educational cutoff for those children in the economy of those countries and in their productivity. And the multi-cost and cross-sectional approach is essential, not just to focus on patient care, but also to approach all the health causes and the social side. And something important, which is something that corresponds to organizations such as ours, which is the coordination that has already been mentioned between the administration, the companies, the local agents, and of course, the aid organizations. Because as you may know, there were neighbor initiatives with support groups and the preparation cannot be left up to the community on its own. There is a preparation and we need to know their needs and their difficulties. And to finish, I'd like to say that the minister mentioned that the pandemic has brought more negative than positive things. And one of the positives has been that eventually we gave visibility to the importance of caring for our mental health. And in these programs, everything we do to prepare for disasters and contingency plans is important to be taking in mind. Thanks so much. Fatima, thank you for your presentation and for your comments and realities and for reminding us about that big impact of the pandemic and the lessons learned. Because with that, we can keep going forward in mental health, mainly with vulnerable groups such as children and refugees or the elderly and so on. So thank you for sharing the key elements and for helping us to try to be a more resilient society. Our next block of panelists, and I'd like to invite the two next panelists. And as we were saying before, not just the pandemic had an impact on mental health, but also on the social, economic, and social labor aspects. And to comment on that experience and those situations, we've got Micah Sanchez, the director of the employment 
and knowledge area of the Spanish Red Cross, Mark Frame, head of the Livelihoods Resource Center of the International Federation of the Red of the Spanish Red Cross, which is hosted here in our office. Without further ado, Michael, you have the floor. Good morning to everyone. As I was listening to my colleagues, I was thinking that, I mean, I was remember, remembering, uh, I mean, working with the staff, with teams, everything that we had to do. And this affected to our mental health. And we have reflected on this after that. Personally, when we were talking about holding this event, one of the questions that I was um, asked to answer was the impact of the, I mean, the economical impact of the pandemics. And the first thing I thought was that if I had to reflect that, I mean, uh, the 13th or 14th of March, we were locked down, and there were different situations that repeated. People who managed to improve their bakery skills because they had time to do it. Why? Because they were in a, I mean, in a situation of record of temporary unemployment regulation and had more time. In fact, 70% of them have, uh, well, uh, decent incomings and time to do it. Another group of people that were working for, like us, 14 hours per day, and, and suddenly we were sent at home with some devices that was the first time that we were using in order to keep working. And this affected to our mental health because, well, we were very, I mean, we had some anxiety because we had to keep up with our work and try to uh, normalize a situation which wasn't normal. And there was also a lot of people that suddenly that day didn't have until then didn't have, I mean, a work contract. They had incomings, but not a work contract. And so they couldn't uh, well, request for that record of temporary unemployment regulation. And those incomings that they were receiving until then uh, disappeared. Or people who had temporary uh, works, uh, those job positions disappeared. And their incomings, too. And in fact, more or less at that time, the tourism season began, I mean, or was supposed to begin, but didn't, and well, they couldn't work. This is how this affected people in the social and economical aspect. Who? Well, mainly this affected according to each uh, labor market. For instance, markets where people have decent jobs that can live uh, well decently, but there are also people that before the pandemics had uh, precarious jobs, jobs that went enough to meet ends, people that had, were unemployed or well, didn't have a stable job. I'm very optimistic because I think that we have learned. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't look like, but we have learned because I think that in our country, we developed the record of temporary unemployment regulation, and this helped to build a screen uh, where, I mean, in a crisis that three million of people were able to receive, keep receiving their incomings despite they went working. This also accelerated the minimum wage for those people that were unemployed and couldn't access to that uh, protection system. It's true that this was very complicated. People had many difficulties. Why? Because we weren't ready. Because we weren't living in a society where services were, were digitalized. So people have many problems to access to those uh, helps or services that they needed. This social economical impact of the pandemics, I mean, we 
keep uh, seeing it in the in, I mean nowadays and one of the main problems was that uh, I mean uh, the time the response time because we all we wanted to protect our lives but also our incomings so we could keep living one of the lessons learned is that now we have a broader vision. All the measures that we implemented needed to have that vision. And for instance, uh, I mean, we can see that in the recovery funds. Europe launched it. resources in order to have a fund so the European citizens could receive money for uh, education, work, and to become more resilient and to provide a response to that situation we were facing. So I, that's why I say I'm an optimistic. It's true that this situation uh, accelerated unemployment. It meant instability or in unstable incomings, but who were the most affected? Well, mainly women, because the uh, economy stopped in tourism, in trading, and in those people. Uh, OK, now you can hear me better, as I always saying. This affected to people that were in our situation. Why? Because these are the group of people, migrant, youth, women, who are more fragile or have uh, weaker incomings. Were we ready? Well, for us, uh, trust was very important. The trust of people who already worked with us. They trusted us. And why was it important? Because we were a reference for them. The companies that we kept working with, uh, they moved uh, their job positions to different uh, well, uh, positions. And this enabled us to train people with digital means in order to help them to um, well, to help people who were afraid of leaving their homes, for instance, and people trusted us when we said it's safe or using this means of, uh, I mean, with this protection. I mean, this was very important, trust, and being able to help people that we worked with. Of the actions that we carried out, we wanted to uh, help people to have a better condition and in order to do that, during the pandemics, we had to mobilize our internal resources in order to organize our teams, uh, the staff and volunteers, and also train people who had to learn to use digital tools that they didn't know how to use. We had to virtualize many of our resources so people could keep training themselves. And this hadn't been possible without local agency alliances with, uh, I mean, with enterprises, public administration, because that helped us in order to make this possible. Without that, we couldn't have been able to do that. And if someone can think, keep think, keeps thinking that you can uh, move on alone, it's because you went there during the pandemics. We updated our services. And now something very important is we realized that the data that we had, we realized that were used by the staff and volunteers. So we know, we knew uh, who were affected at what level. And so we knew, well, who needed us. We used all our resources, all our means. We became more flexible doing this way, this other way. It didn't care the mean, 
the important thing was to be there for the people who needed us. Uh, was a platform, didn't matter. People were, uh, I mean, uh, our um, focus point regarding uh, the work aspect, the liberal aspect. We created a fundamental tool in order to gather the information that, uh, I mean, the public administration was launching, so we could provide uh, information. So, uh, in order to create a link where uh, the companies could uh, find uh, the workers that they needed, um, more than five million visualizations in less of in less than three months of this information. So people could find the information that needed. And well, what's the lessons learned? That everything we did was, to, I mean, we mainstreamed it. Now we have uh, semi-presential um, webinars, so people can keep um, training and despite distance, uh, people can keep, uh, as, as, as we said, keep training themselves. We have changed our mindset because we have understood that we can provide our services wherever we are and without regard of the needs of every person. We have learned that we need to have a continuous training in order to provide better services. All the recovery funds have uh, highlighted that we must invest not only in health uh, services, but also in skill development of people, in being able to give response. In economy, must focus on people because we are not um, productive elements. And as we were talking uh, before in mental health, I mean, when we watch the news and we heard that uh, there are enough workers, uh, people have learned that not every job is OK. We can't work at any price, because our mental health is also important. That taught us, uh, the pandemics, we need to live with uh, dignified conditions, with incomings, but also being able to take care of our families, to, well, to keep up with our lives, to enjoy. And for that, the working conditions must uh, help us to combine life and work. For us, it was also very important um, to, I mean, in, to have robust uh, public policies regarding uh, work, not only policies that must be there when we need them in order to accelerate something, but also long-term policies in order to help to people who are facing uh, more difficult situations so they can, well, take a step and 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 well to have a better life and well that's it thank you very much i think that that's enough <laughs>
uh, pandemics exacerbated inequalities and stopped and erased every progress done in regarding the global um, sustainable goals of the 2030 agenda. And uh, we saw an increase of extreme poverty in, I mean, during 25 years, we could see a reduction of that extreme poverty. But uh, during the pandemic, it increased in a 10 percent, and many people entered to that list. It's interesting to bear this in mind because this lead to many people to face uh, survival mechanisms. And when I say survival mechanisms are the mechanisms that we use when we are in a difficult economical situation. Sometimes you can reverse them, for instance, reduce or, or use our savings um, and and but in other situations this means to use mechanisms that cannot be reversed for instance selling our assets for instance a taxi driving driver that has to uh, sell their car and sometimes even worse for instance using uh, harmful strategies like forced marriages and prostitution. And when I was talking about the people who entered, um, 115 million of people entered that extreme poverty list. These are people that, who have lost their um, livelihoods and their safety net network. I wanted to highlight two As I was saying, I want to highlight that the pandemic affected mostly three groups internationally as a common pattern. And as mentioned in the socioeconomic impact report of the pandemic made by the International Federation of the Red Cross, there are three main groups. First, together, well, coincides with what Mike mentioned, it is a group of women internationally. And women work mostly in the informal sector without contracts, and they lost their jobs. And even those who had one, a job, many of them work in sectors such as tourism and, or services where they were seriously affected by the pandemic situation. The second group that I'd like to highlight that was mo most affected were people living in urban areas. And that's a change of paradigm regarding human international humanitarian crisis, because usually we associate social areas to more vulnerability. And in this case, the lockdown measures and other restrictions affected more acutely the urban economies, and they led to the search of new vulnerable groups, as we saw in Spain, too. And here on the screen, you may see a pre-representative case. In 2019, before the pandemic, Colombia had a poverty rate high of 35.7 percent. And in 2020, one year later, that rate increased by 7 percent. But it's interesting to see and to illustrate what I mentioned that the poverty rate increased by 10 percent in urban centers, while, paradoxically, in rural areas, it decreased by 4 percent. Another vulnerable group, again, is migrant people. Usually, migrants, out of the context we know in Spain, in international realities are out of the protection systems of the country, and they're usually exposed to higher poverty and food insecurity. Regarding the question of how f far were we prepared for the pandemic and for this effect that I've just described, globally, and as highlighted in the World Disaster Report, most countries were not prepared 
and we lacked a plan to face this kind of outbreak with such a massive impact amongst other, f other fields on the economy and the labor market. Regarding the preparedness of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, each national society experienced a very different reality according to two factors. First, the health reality of each country, which was different, and secondly, the preparation and the response of each country, which was also different. But what the report highlights quite interestingly is that our answers as national societies were usually very well integrated in the governmental responses, and they were also complementary and we could give additional services, contributing, in fact, to the three main basic principles that we've heard this morning, that are equity, trust, and local action. And to begin with equity, and as we've heard regarding the Spanish reality, equal access was promoted for um, services and essential products, mainly amongst the most vulnerable groups. To illustrate this, I want to show the case of Turkey. In 2020, the Turkish Red Crescent and the International Federation made the largest money transfer program in history in one single country, with a disbursement of more than 45 million euros for 1.7 million people. And I want to highlight here the principle of equity in a difficult situation. We believed in supporting financially those people that we saw amongst the most vulnerable groups, which are refugees. Regarding trust, trust was important, as you may have heard this morning, according to the link we had between national societies and the recipients of our aid. Prior work of social inclusion had been done throughout the years and decades, also in many countries regarding disaster preparedness. And here on the screen we have the example of the Azerbaijan's Red Crescent that for the first time had a money transfer program. That's quite interesting, just like many other national societies. And we'd also like to highlight that these were families with whom they had been working in the previous years. Thirdly, the local and community action. Because from the different national societies, we worked with a local and community approach to promote community resilience and protecting the livelihoods. To illustrate this principle, I'm bringing a project from Rwanda where, I've, where I have the chance of participating and doing the technical follow-up where we made money transfers at the worst time in the pandemic. And what I'd like to highlight here is that these were women in agricultural cooperatives with whom we have been working for seven years. So there was a link there, there was a bond, and we also worked from the local assemblies of the Rwanda Red Cross. And I insist on the local assemblies factor. Regarding the response we gave, I have already advanced some information. In when I spoke about the, the quality, trust, and local action principles, but we should highlight that the pandemic response was global, and it reached more than 1.2 billion people, if we take into account the total accumulated number of people that all the national societies reached, and specifically, and to face the socioeconomic effects of the pandemic, we gave training and capacity building, often online training, to more than 270,000 people to improve their work search possibilities. And we gave food and other items to more than 92 million people. And we supported the livelihoods of the people affected in critical moments with money transfers and coupons to more than 6 million people. 
And besides money transfers, we also had the so-called early recovery actions that counteract more sustainably the effects and the impact of the pandemic, amongst which, as you may see on the screen, may highlight the support for the primary production. Inputs were provided for the next harvest or campaign in Valley moments, aid to entrepreneurship, to resume or initiate new small business, access to microfunding or microfinancing through mostly through savings groups, and also helping employability through the individual guidance to access a changing labor market. The Center of Livelihoods that we present, which is a federation center, backed up, supported, and funded by the Spanish Red Cross, has the mandate to support the whole of the national societies globally, to generate knowledge around recovery, financial recovery projects, so they may be more efficient. And in this task, we should highlight that these answers that we've presented today have been possible thanks to the collaboration of key partners. And we need to begin by speaking about our own Red Cross partners, as well as other institutional partners, such as the Humanitarian Aid Office of the European Union, ECHO, as well as this centralized cooperation that at a point of serious crisis didn't just look at the internal crisis we had in the country, but they also decided to devote some salary financial resources internationally, and mainly with the support of the International Cooperation Agency, the Spanish International Cooperation Agency for, the, for Development, that shows that with instruments such as the emergency agreement, we can respond quickly and flexibly with a multi-annual program for funding. We can therefore respond to the impact of situations as extreme as this pandemic. Last, we have learned that, as we've repeated before, most countries are not very prepared to face situations similar to the pandemic. The preparedness, as we've heard today, is only effective if it's, if it's based on equality, trust, and local action. The pandemic has taught us that, on, that omitting these principles, whether in the preparation or the response, has important negative effects in all areas, also in economic safety. Throughout the report we presented, we have therefore seen how the Red Cross and the Red Crescent have been able to complement the global responses and the responses from national and local governments. And we have been able to be in an international network of national societies supporting each other with very high trust indices in their countries, with a volunteering network with local capillarity reaching all the populations, pretty much. And last, I'd like to say that the Red Cross and the Red Crescent understand how our 2030 is reflected and that humanitarian action goes beyond helping people to resist and to overcome crisis, because it entails working so that these people and communities may have opportunities as in the 2030 strategy, not just to survive, but to prosper and live in a dignified and peaceful life. Last, I'd like to say that for whoever needs more information, at the stand we have more documents, and they're also easily accessible on the website. We have a socioeconomic COVID impact report, as well as other documents that you may find there. Thanks so much. Thank you both, Mike and Mark. Thank you for sharing the comprehensive approach, not just from the health perspective, but also from the social labor and social economic perspective. And that could be useful, and fingers crossed, for future pandemics, so they will not happen. So we now open a third block in case you have any specific answers or for discussion regarding the role in the COVID-19 pandemic, 
and we're going to have a brief time for questions you may have or ideas, comments before we go to the next part. If anyone has any comment or question, please go ahead. And we need the microphone, by the way, so that everyone can hear you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to ask about the following. International regarding livelihoods, how did you act to improve employability? Well, within the areas you mentioned, because I work in employment in MICA, I report to MICA, and I'd like to know what has been done, because microcredits are more for entrepreneurship, but regarding improving employability, which actions have been carried out? Sure. Well, ideally, we have worked from the Spanish Red Cross, and that's a reality I'm familiar with. We have worked on micro-entrepreneurship projects, supporting at specific points and giving sometimes financial aid to solve the specific problems that were one off and maybe they couldn't market products. And specifically regarding employability, we mostly did online training. We mostly did training targeted to one hundred well to forty national societies to work as we do in the Spanish Red Cross and on the one hand to reinforce the profile of each person, of each job hunter, and also to enable the integration by raising awareness with companies so these people could be reintegrated. Another question, Cristina. Very quickly, thank you for being here, for your presentations, brilliant presentations. And I have a question for Ma Maika. You were saying that women, I mean, well, uh, the, the pandemics doesn't affect, uh, didn't affect everyone equally, and this affected to the most vulnerable groups, among them women. Uh, you said something about this, but could you, well, talk about uh, the response uh, regarding employability for, I mean, for women from the Spanish Red Cross? Yes, as I said at international level too, this affected mainly to women because most women that we work with are, I mean, they provide uh, incomings in their families because they, they are in a one of parental situations. And they also work in sectors that the pandemics hit the most for instance, in hospitality, in aid, in tourism. So if we uh, have that they didn't have stable incomings, as I said, uh, the lockdown came just right before Easter, and that meant that those women that were waiting for that season to work, they had a great disadvantage in compared in other people that worked in different uh, areas. And on the other hand, m many women worked in, I mean, in, in aid uh, or in, in caring uh, services. So for instance, schools were closed. So uh, children didn't go to school and they then go to park and so they couldn't work taking care of them and and so we had a situation where they had to cho I mean, and of course they had to stay at home and take care of the children so they had to choose between going to find a, another job or staying home and taking care of the children so we established an online platform so they could uh, they, I mean, they, they couldn't find a balance between life and family, for instance, providing them with laptops, um, also 
giving them access to information, to have access to fundings, for instance, or helps. And we adapted our responses so they could keep training and learning. So once the lockdown was uh, over, they could uh, join or find a new job. Another question over there? Yes. Well, thank you for those examples. In fact, you have provided uh, uh, examples of the way we adapted ourselves in order to keep providing our services. Uh, services. We've talked about mental health and about many things. Um, of the things that you had to apply at your job positions, which one do you think that we should keep and today, and it's been a key element in order to move on. Which one would you choose which has meant uh, well, a good impact in our efforts? Thank you very much. I think that, well, Micah already uh, said it. I mean, one of those uh, examples was using digital tools in order to provide services to people and do it in a creative way, in an efficient way. At the beginning, we reacted as we could, but then with time, we, we worked in a more robust way. And we have kept that, for instance, the hotlines, the social networks, online training, finding the balance between on-site and online. I think that was a great uh, lesson. And as a response uh, tool, I mean, it's now here with us today. Yes, in fact, I think that today we couldn't think of our staff and volunteers teams um, not having access to our virtual campus and having access to all the information, all the pills. Two, three years ago, that didn't exist. And now we can't live without it. Or we, in order to provide an answer to, uh, I mean, to our region, now we have uh, like a territorial or national approach. And I think that we have become more efficient. We are more agile when providing a response. And from and since the pandemics, we have learned to support ourselves in a multi-channel system using different, uh, I don't know, orientation programs, for instance, building a curriculum. And we have learned that we don't need to go to people's home, no. People can come to our facilities and receive the same, I mean, in, a plat in the platforms, and they can receive exactly the same services that uh, we provide in our facilities. In my case, I would like, I mean, I would highlight the cash transfers. And I already talked about this in my presentation, but I would like to clarify them. It's uh, giving cash with uh, prepaid cards or things like that, uh, something similar to the Bizum that we have here, or with coupons that they, they could, um, well, uh, uh, use in, in small uh, businesses. And during the pandemics, uh, we realized that those cash transfer People were reluctant to use them. Uh, they didn't understand why we were giving them money. But now we've seen uh, an increase in the use of this system. 60 countries had problems with the cash transfers. And they had to channel this through the Red Cross or the Red Crescent. But that dynamic has kept in time and has enabled us to develop our digital system so we can improve our, uh, our cash transfers, 
to make um, to become more efficient for instance in Ukraine we knew that people could subscribe collectively in databases and have access to different processes so the cash transfers programs it's something that it's going to stay with us in the future on my behalf i would highlight the i mean in mental health the new services hotline the help services that has enabled us to keep in contact with people and support them in mental health in and in an um, overall point of view I would highlight the coordination inside uh, our centers compared to previous experiences we created uh, pro uh, centralized protocols in order to infect uh, other ambulances to avoid um, infections and we have adapted ourselves to the needs that we well, we faced and again something that we were already doing and was a strengthen uh, during the pandemics was well the aid to or improvement uh, of the services that we provide to our staff and and volunteers well do we have a very specific reflection yes we can't hear we've been able to use what we already have in our centers and use them in a very specific situations for instance uh, well providing assistance to frontline interveners and the international national cooperation we provided assistance we took care of people that I mean, due to different reasons were, that we're living in our country. And we've been able to use that. I mean, all, all the lessons learned in different situations. We used that in a very specific situation, which was a COVID-19 crisis. I wanted to share that that we've been able to well to use everything that we've learned during different uh, experiences, and 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 now we have them and we've used them uh, positively. Well, I would like to thank the four of you, Fatima, Mark, Ma uh, Maria, and Micah. Thank you for being here today, sharing your experiences. And now we are going to close this event. We are going to uh, provide a space to the conclusions. Maria del Mar Pajeo, please come back to the stage. She's going to share without her conclusions. Okay, I, I, I'll move here. Well, first of all, I think that this has been an amazing uh, debate. Congratulations. I'm going to be very brief. As David say, I'm going to share uh, well, a reflection. Uh, I mean, we've said so many important things that I'm sure that I missed uh, some of them. But I just want to share some ideas. Uh, the first thing I would emphasize um, are four main, main three elements that help us to be ready in any crisis and that during the pandemics were key factors trust because as uh, i mean spanish red cross and international federation we have helped people that in a specific moment of their life of the right came to us in order to i mean looking for help equity which is uh, already in our services in and in our responses and in, in crisis and we know that this is a critic factor and we use uh, pre-existing uh, services and also local action 
our local agents have been uh, key elements in order to establish new bonds between administration, public administration enterprises and society. The pandemic has meant a huge challenge in many senses, but also, uh, well, uh, the beginning of a uh, network uh, or, uh, yeah, or a collective response. We work in a more co comprehensive, coordinated, coordinated, flexible, and agile, and multidisciplinary way. And we were ad able to adapt. We must adapt to changes and mobilize all resources in different places and in different areas to provide more robust and stable services that minimize the negative impact of emergencies. We also learn a new way of doing things. We include uh, technological means in order to provide individualized support and even uh, remote in remote um, context. And in fact, we help people to develop the digital skills in order to be able to go back to Europe. Another aspect that has been strongly repeated is that the pandemic has hit the most vulnerable groups especially hard, increasing uh, pre-existing inequalities. The implementation of social protection and health measures, aid mechanisms that dignify people, such as, such as cash transfer, and the warranty of equitable access to resources to the entire population represent crucial and aid measures. We also talk about the mainstreaming of psycho uh, psychological and emotional support in this type of crisis and facilitating these two people affected by this situation and also to our staff and volunteers. Finally, I would like to talk about a key factor, which is proximity, proximity to the communities. It's a key factor because it consolidates the bond, closeness, and trust, thanks also to transparent and efficient communication. We trust those that we know, the people who attend to our needs and the things that we understand in the sense any effort to integrate and sensitize the population will always uh, a good thing. These have been uh, some of the ideas that we've uh, heard today. And due to the relevance of the topics that we've discussed, I think that has been a very important, uh, I mean, event. And I would like to Remember you, remind you that all the responses that we provided were thanks to all the people that work with us, and we can't forget that. This, wherever we act and whenever we act, we must uh, thank uh, to the International Federation. I would like to uh, highlight this with the intention of keep. I mean, to keep these networks. And I would like to remind you something that we already heard. The responses that we provide as uh, organization, I mean, for focusing on needs are, I mean, are important, but we must focus on future, on people, making sure that, that people live with uh, dignity. That's very important. And finally, um, well, I would like to thank to all of you that you've been here today with us, and also to the ministry. But he left at the beginning, but it's been very important to have him here today. Um, and since, I, I mean, now that we are among family, I think that's very, I mean, I will say that it's very important to have him here today. I would like to, uh, to thank um, uh, to the vice uh, 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 consular, 
uh, Daniel Fernandez uh, for facilitating the session. Also to, um, I mean, to, to Micah, Maria, Mark, Fatima, and also to the International Federation, uh, to Gabriela Perullo for the coordination, and well, for, to all of you. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the session as I did.